I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Um, Marlene Trump, our president at Boise State University, is um, a hero for me. She is passionate about her work as a leader. She lives her values and she has used her voice to lift higher education, education throughout the state and um, has been a very courageous soul in some very challenging um, situations. She joined us here at Boise State in 2019 and uh, really walked into, I think, a situation where no leaders of higher education had a path, had a, had a, had a, um, had a plan for how you address and support students, faculty and staff uh, during a pandemic. So she comes to Boise and to Idaho with experience as a leader, but also understanding rural America. Um, President Trump was raised in Green River, Wyoming. So she knows rural and uh, had to go to way to school to, to get her um, higher education um, and is again, passionate about the work that she brings to education and today she is joining us to share her caregiver and story that she lives um, uh, in addition to her professional responsibilities. And with that, um, President Trump, I'll turn the time over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for that incredibly generous and kind introduction. Very moved by that. Thank you so much. And I am truly honored to be here amongst all of you. Um, I, I, I felt very fortunate to have the opportunity to speak. So if I can have um, Pat, or Kat, excuse me. Thank you, Kat, jump into the slides. Um, when most people pass me on the street, they know me as one thing and they very, very often know me as a university president. I go nowhere in sweats. <laughs> I am, of course, many other things as well. I'm an academic, I'm a mother, I'm a runner, and today I'm here because I am a caregiver. My 93, almost 94-year-old mother lives in my home. Her bedroom is right next to mine. I feel grateful to have the opportunity to care for her. I have had the gift of feeling my mother's deep love my entire life. And now I have the profound gift of serving her as she served me. I love my mom with every fiber of my being and my beautiful and loving mother, Eileen, has Alzheimer's. Your engagement here means a great deal to me, not just because I'm a scholar who's delighted by the pursuit of knowledge and new ideas that can make an impact on the world, but because I love my mother and I wanna be a better caregiver for her and for her to have the best life that she can. This work of caregiving is hard. We often acknowledge the challenges of raising children and share those struggles with one another. We've only recently begun to publicly articulate the stressors, exhaustion, heartbreak, frustration that can accompany the joy of being a family caregiver. Today, I wanna to talk to you a bit about my journey, both to honor my mother and to honor you. As the theme of this year's conference is embracing caregivers and their myriad identities, I am so happy to share this with you. My mom's story is in many ways my story, but in order for me to tell that story, I need to give you a sense of who she is and how she helped make me who I am, not just as her caregiver, but as her daughter. Kat, can I have the next slide, please? Here we are out to dinner in her favorite place in 2015. Um, at this time, she already had dementia, um, and uh, there, but it had not yet been diagnosed. And I knew that there was um, a serious challenge that she was facing because I had gotten the honor of winning an award in the state, um, a statewide award for women in, in education. 
And I had told her about it and told her about the award ceremony and we had planned the trip. And um, we had talked about the fact that because it was in Northern Arizona, it was gonna be much colder than in Phoenix and she'd have to pack a little differently. So we chose some clothes. And, and then the next day I went up to talk to her about it again. And she said, what award? So for her, the, this event that had made her weep with joy was gone already. Now, I want you to take a close look at this picture and remember this picture because I'm gonna come back to it a little later. Um, next slide, please, Kat. My mom loves angels, in part because she is so like one herself. And my son picked out this sweet gift for her Christmas of that same year in 2015. I could show you a dozen pictures like this and I'm gonna give you a few more of them. Of my mom dressed in her radical Christmas themed gear opening another angel from Jacob. Um, next slide, please, Kat. There's a, a sweet little angel she's holding in her hand and these are her fa la la la, -la <laughs> Christmas sweats. Um, She's a person who has always had a deep spiritual life, a deep spiritual connection. And she taught me that connections to family were some of the most important connections that a person could have. And so for her, it was a real priority to think about um, how we connected to the spiritual world and how we connected to each other. And, and that's what you see throughout these pictures. Kat, can I have the next slide, please? If you remember the first picture I showed you, you'll recognize that this is the same face. <laughs> my son used that image to make this as a Christmas gift for my mom in Photoshop. Because whenever my mom would ask who someone was, my son and his dad would answer Mel Gibson as a joke. So she laughed for 15 straight minutes when she saw this picture. Um, next slide, please, Kat. This is her opening that crazy gift. Um, she just roared with laughter. And for her, joy is such a fun fundamental part of who she is. And you can also see one of her other sweet Christmas sweaters here. Um, she loved, she was surprised every time and she loved the joke. In fact, um, my mom is Finnish. And uh, we grew up speaking Finglish at home, a little bit of Finn, a little bit of English. And uh, my son has perfect Finnish pronunciation, but he doesn't speak Finn. There are only two things my son says. He says, Rakistan Sinua, which means I love you. And he calls my mother Mumma, which is Finnish for granny. And uh, the other thing that he can say is the word Yolobuki. Yolobuki is Santa Claus in Finnish, but it's the way he answers everything that my mother says in Finn. So whenever my mother says something in Finn, he always says Yolobuki, and every time she laughs. Um, if I can add the next slide, please, Kat. Here's another Christmas sweatshirt and another Christmas. Um, this one, of course, is combining her love of both angels and Christmas. It's a Christmas angel sweatshirt, um, and that's in 2017. Um, if I can have the next slide, Kat. Oops, I think we, did we go to? Nope, this is it. Thank you, you're, you're right on the mark, Kat. Um, my mom has a fairly large supply of Christmas sweaters, so you'll get to see some more of those and sweatshirts um, shortly. My mom always looked beautiful always looked beautiful. And for her, um, it was a, an emblem of her internal joy. Um, this, of course, is our whole family. Um, and that's me with the, the missing tooth down at the bottom and my big sister. Um, she was a person who uh, really cared about letting her inner light shine. And so you see it in virtually every picture Next slide, please, Kat. She even looked beautiful when her daughters had completely 80s hair. <laughs> so it's, uh, we're not gonna linger on this slide. Can we have the next one, please? Um, 
she was the person who thought Christmas was so important to her for spiritual reasons and for family reasons that she always dressed up for Christmas. Uh, this is my mom with my dad in 2018. Next slide, please. And she was a person who always cared about, um, as we march through these decades and you see her age, this is when I was a dean at Arizona State University. And you can see her unconditional and unequivocal love and joy. She always brought and continues to bring such great joy to my life. Can I have the next slide, please, Kat? And there's a sort of magical silliness about my mom. Uh, when we came to Boise and we found this new house, um, <clears throat> she went out onto the front deck and she did what she called a couch dance for me, where she sat on the couch and, and uh, out on the deck and danced for me. She's just a delightful, joyous person. And next slide, please, Kat. And this is my mom at my inauguration at Boise State University. Um, as glamorous as ever um, with my handsome son, who's now a little more grown up. This was in 2019. I'm going to show you some videos too, so you can get a chance to hear her. Next slide, please. My first year here, I was able to bring my mom to a football game and my mom played in the band when she was in high school and she cheered on the cheer squad. So she was really excited to meet the cheerleaders and she was really excited to get out on that blue field and to be a part of all the joy of that day. Um, she, uh, she didn't need a wheelchair uh, to get around, but she moved slowly and we wanted her to get to see everything. So we took her to where the football team runs out and she got to watch them charge out onto the field with the flag, the bleed blue flag and the hammer that they run out with at every game. And she got to watch the band perform from the field and she got to watch the cheerleaders cheer and she had so much joy in that day. <clears throat> and there was a rather magical event that happened that night. So we have on the football field, a platform that um, Buster, our school mascot runs up onto to work up the student section of the stands, which is called the corral. And uh, I was able to bring my mom up onto that platform to meet our students. So Kat, if you could cue the next slide and run the video, please. Thank you so much, Kat. My mother told me the next morning, she came into my room after this game and after this experience, and she told me that was one of the most magical moments of her entire life. I feel so fortunate to have her with me and to have the chance to have that kind of fun with her. Next slide, please. She loves to laugh. And it, <laughs> and it brings me such joy. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this and then I'll have Kat run this video. I thought it was hard to explain who my mom is as a person without you getting to see her live. So um, as many of you will know, we had um, cardboard cutouts at our football games when we weren't allowed to have fans during that difficult year for our student athletes, when we weren't allowed to have fans. And so um, I purchased one for my mom, I purchased one for me, and the, those funds went to help support our student athletes in a year when we couldn't sell tickets to our venues. And, and then these, these cutouts were at our, our football games and in our basketball arena. 
And my mom had never seen them and she wasn't aware that um, we were getting these cutouts made. So I brought one home for her. I brought hers home and I brought mine home for her. And this is a video of her seeing this cutout for the first time. Kat, can you run this video, please? Okay, you ready? Okay, look, look down here. is a person who loves to laugh. She is a person who exudes joy. She's always loved to dance too. So um, part of the reason that we had such a delightful relationship growing up is that she would always dance with me. And uh, she taught me how to polka when I was a very young girl. And when I was too little to do the steps on my own or I couldn't keep up, she would put my feet on her feet and we would dance together. So I am uh, I made a video with her for our graduates when our students were unable to come face to face for graduation. And so that's the next little video and it's the last video I have to show you. So Kat, can you please scroll to that? And fire this one up. Congratulations, graduates! Congratulations, graduates! <laughs> okay, I hope it worked out. You want to see it? <laughs> it was so much fun to make that um, video, and it was uh, such a joy to see her express her joy, and to express herself. This year at Christmas, my mom wouldn't wear any of her Christmas clothes. She wandered away several times to go back to her room, even though she had many presents under the tree. She struggled to understand what was happening when we opened our gifts. Just before Christmas, I saw her sneaking across her bedroom and I asked her why. And she explained to me that someone had snuck into her room and installed a camera with a roving eye that watched her everywhere she went. She whispered to me, I had to go change my clothes in the bathroom. The camera was a standard smoke detector that had been in her room the entire time we lived here. I got up on a ladder and took it down to show her I pressed the button so it tested the alarm so she could see what its function was. And I reminded her, dad had these in every room in the house to keep us safe, mom, and we had them too. One Sunday, she called me into her, um, her room to ask how my sister had died. It nearly took me off my feet. When my father, her truly beloved husband, passed away, all she could say through her tears was, now you'll get to see our other daughter again. Her greatest comfort was knowing that my father would meet my lost sister in heaven. This powerful, informative event in her life is now just a blank to her. In fact, when I told her the story about my sister's death, she said, I wonder if I forgot because it makes me so sad to remember it. And I said, because it's what her doctors had told us to do. I think you forgot mom because of the Alzheimer's, but it's okay. The pandemic had the effect on my mom that it had on many people who were elderly, whether they were at home or in care centers. She got out far, far less. 
There weren't football games. There weren't events. She wasn't able to go to the grocery store anymore because for her, that just wasn't safe. At 93, um, with underlying health conditions, it wouldn't have been safe for her to go out into a public place before there was a vaccine and before we understood how the virus spread. She couldn't shop downtown. She couldn't meet new people. And this contraction of her world accelerated a shrinking inside of her too. She used to love to go out and see Christmas lights. Now she'll rarely get into the car. And if we do make a decision that we have to go out as we did when we took her to get her vaccine booster this year, she often experiences violent bouts of diarrhea, which are triggered by her anxiety and which produce emotional strain for all of us, most especially for her. Now, ordinarily, when I talk about my mother, I don't mention this story, but I think it's important for people who are dealing with family caregivers to be honest about the challenges and hardships of these roles, as well as the wonders of being able to care for people, often people who cared for us. Um, I've had to take over all of my mother's finances and take over her meal planning and take over her medications that she takes for the kinds of chronic challenges that you face when you're the age of someone who's 93. And I'm honored to be able to do this for her knowing how much she did for me as a child, but that work doesn't make it easier. And it's harder for her to get out now. Her disease continues to progress and her growing need doesn't change the needs I have in my workplace or at home with my son, who while very bright, very talented is also on the autism spectrum. So I have to have somebody who comes and stays with her when I'm away at work. And sometimes even when I'm home, I need special help. There are some days that at work that are stressful and I used to be able to come home and talk with my mom about these things and share the bond that we had together um, and get her support. But now most days when I come home, if I'm fortunate enough to get home before she goes to bed, I see her every day. I leave the house before she's awake usually in the morning. And when I get home, she always asks, how is everything at work? Is everything okay? And we're, we're at the point with her now where the only way I'm allowed to answer is, everything's just dandy, mom. And then she says, I'm so glad it's good. Your dad would be so proud his chest would be pushed out so far, he would be so proud of you. And I feel very fortunate that I get to have that conversation with my mom every day. And she always asks my sister how her pets are. My sister has three cats and three little dogs. And she asks my sister, how's the fur family? Every time she talks to my sister, she talks to my sister usually four times on the weekend. And those conversations are only a few minutes each but she just gets to check in and hear my sister's voice a couple of times every weekend. I never miss the opportunity to talk with her when I arrive home before she goes to bed. And I treasure each one of these moments, even if our conversation today is exactly the same as it was the day before. The statement she makes most often to me is one that she taught me through the most difficult period of her illness. I have a jar that I keep in um, the front room of the house. It's a, it's a really large mason jar. And next to it are small slips of paper and a pen. And everyone in my family or anyone who comes to visit my house is invited to write on any day the thing that they're grateful for. And they can drop it into that jar. And then at Christmas dinner, we take out all the little slips of paper in the jar and read those little slips. And every year my mom writes the same message. Thank you for accepting me into your home. I'm so grateful. And she worries that because of her illness that she'll become a burden on me. And so 
this year for Christmas, I got her a silver bracelet that I had engraved with the message, I love you, mom, and I'm so grateful that you're here. Acceptance is a lesson I continue learning from my mother even now. She loved me unconditionally through all the phases of my life and with all of my flaws when I was a teenager and, and when I went through difficult periods, she was always there with me. She babysat my son when I was a young professor, even though he was very difficult, um, very challenging to manage when he was a little boy. She was the one who did my childcare because we couldn't find a childcare provider for him who could manage him. So my mom not only raised me, she helped me raise my son. She continues to love him with all of her heart to this day. I have a complex and often complicated life. I'm not just a daughter. I'm a president, I'm a boss, I'm a mother, I'm a writer, I'm a hiker, I'm a runner. We all have so many identities, as my mom has, over the course of her life and over the course of mine. There's been one constant for me. I don't need a Christmas sweatshirt or a trim tree or a holiday meal to think of angels. My mother is my angel, no matter how she changes. And I have learned to accept her as she is. And to know that even now, she can still have joy. This picture is um, when I had the great honor of having a presidential portrait created. And I had to coax her to come out and see it, but I knew she wouldn't be able to see it unless she saw it at the opening in the gallery. So we arranged a special visit before all the other guests arrived. And she stayed for only a few minutes, but she wept with joy. I've also learned to accept myself as I struggle to shift my relationship to the person who was my best friend for so much of my life and to continue to live alongside her as her disease progresses. I know because it is a progressive disease that it won't get easier. All, however, is not lost. As a dear friend of mine advised me, she may not remember what you say, but she will remember how you make her feel. And I remember, I remember how she has always made me feel, loved. My goal now is simply for her to feel loved too. During this special conference, I hope that you'll feel support discover tools, shore up your strength for the road ahead, care for your mind and body, map a path for your future, and remember that you too deserve care so you can live your best life, one worthy of the family that has brought you here today and worthy of all that you give and all that you deserve to become. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you today. President Trump, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I don't know if you're watching the chat, but it's, it's blowing up with applause and appreciation. And um, I'm so glad I have my tissue box right here beside me. That's a very, I just, you're, you're willing to share and be so open with your process is, um, I honor you and thank you for that. <clears throat> you are a force and we appreciate what you bring to this caregiver conference. Uh, and to the state of Idaho, thank you for, for being here and thank you for your work that you do as a caregiver and um, that is um, amazing. We have some time, yeah, again, the chat has just exploded with, with appreciation. I, I'm so, you have touched many today. Um, we do have some time for a Q&A if folks have a question. Uh, I think we would be happy to, to field that. Um, 
And Kat, if, if folks have a question, can they just uh, put it in the Q&A is what I'm assuming um, how they would communicate? Yes, that's correct. Um, the Q&A is best. Mike, that's a, a great question of you know, uh, President Trump. How, how do you, what, what and how do you fit in time for yourself to care for you? Thank you so much for asking that question. And I'm, I'm really glad um, uh, that someone asked it because I think it's really important. Um, I learned a long time ago that uh, I had to get up really, really early in the morning in order to have a quiet time for myself. Um, and so I get up often at 4.30 in the morning and um, I, uh, I work out and I meditate and I often do yoga. And, um, and then every night at the end of the day, I spend a little time journaling. I've, I'm, I've been journaling since I was about um, 14 years old and I have all those journals back over the course of my whole life. And um, it is... Uh, really important to me to take that time for myself. And I hope that you all will find ways to take time for yourself. I cared for my father when he was dying of lung cancer, and that was about a two-year journey. And it was extremely hard, and I was pregnant at the time. So we lost my dad when I was pregnant with my son. And um, uh, it, was, uh, it was really important to me to find little spaces of time to really step away and care for myself. And at one point, um, I even made a trip when my dad was ill, um, right after he'd been diagnosed with a big recurrence. And um, the doctor said, I, we had, my dad and I had made plans to go to Egypt together. It was his lifelong dream to see Egypt. And the doctor said, Marlene, you should still go. You should still go and bring back your dad pictures and, and get a chance to take a breath. Um, if I, if I may, Sarah, I saw another question. What is one thing you would have liked to have known before when, when I started this journey? And, and what I wish someone had told me was, you're not gonna get everything right. There are gonna be times when you make mistakes and you just have to always do the best you can with what you've got and really reach out for connection to other people because that connection to other people um, is so powerful in helping to restore us. I see another really good question, Sarah, if I can answer one more. Yes, yes. Um, it, it's how did you um, deal with seeing your mother go from joy to none to fearful? Um, it's very hard. Um, that's been one of the hardest things is to see as um, her uh, illness progresses, to see the way in which it's, stealing her her native joy in life and um, replacing it with fear or anxiety um, and and to really see her changing as a person. And what I have to remind myself, it was especially hard for me at Christmas because it upset my son too to see her you know stepping away and he was experiencing distress and and um, uh, I have to remind myself that um, I, this, this is going to sound like such a ridiculous metaphor, but I saw the movie Benjamin Button decades ago when it came out. And um, this man who reverse ages and becomes a baby again. And I see my mother um, needing more and more from me. And I think of her like a picture she has on her wall when she was a little girl and she's more anxious and more afraid now, but she still has this wonderful life that she's lived and all that she's given to so many people. And I just wanna give her peace and joy. And I do a lot of 
a lot of prayer and a lot of meditation too. There is a, a question in the Q&A as well of, of it, thinking about the systems of support. Um, is there, if, if there was one thing that you could change about ability to access resources or supports, specifically related to the dementia, Alzheimer's disease, what, what, would, what would that be? I think that the, the thing I think about the most is I'm very fortunate um, I have a family member who can be with my mom while I'm away at work even. So there's somebody who's at the house with her whenever I'm gone. And she's she's not ever wandered away or done anything dangerous at home alone. But um, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have a family member who can who has the flexibility because he works remotely to be able to be to work at my house during the day and be with her. But the thing that I would change is I want for everyone to have the confidence in a caregiver when they have to be away, whether that's for their own restoration, to go to the store, to go to a job, to care for their children, to do whatever it is that they have to do. I wish that there were um, more options for caregivers. And when I first moved to Idaho, before my mother had the needs that she has now, um, I, I went to a service to hire a caregiver. And what they told me was that they would send in different caregivers and the principle behind it was um, really valuable. They were trying to make sure that if someone left that work, a person wouldn't be bereft and traumatized. They wanted to make sure there were multiple caregivers. But for my mother, that was extremely stressful. And she found it so stressful that she asked me through a veil of tears to please make them stop coming. And so I had to, I look at that situation and I think what a challenge that is for people who, and I don't know how long my family member who's able to do that care right now will be able to do it. And I don't know how long I'll be able to keep her at home and I'll have to keep recalibrating, but I worry a lot and I feel very keenly for people who don't have access to um, that kind of stable caregiving support, um, especially for someone who has some kind of dementia because my mother doesn't know many people anymore. And um, it's it would be very stressful for her to feel there was a stranger coming into the home every day um, because she's a, a very anxious, anxious person. Um, I have a, my best friend from college just moved to Boise about seven or eight months ago. And it's been such an incredible gift to me. And uh, of course, my mom has known Susan since I was 18 years old. And so most of my life. And she it was clear to me she didn't recognize Susan, even though Susan looks almost exactly the same when she saw her the first several times she saw her. But just a couple of weeks ago, I was teaching Susan how to make um, a Finnish bread that's traditional in my family um, called pula. And um, uh, when I was, I had Susan over, she was over for most of the day because it's a long process. Um, it's a beautiful braided bread. And uh, my mom came into the kitchen while I was making it because she could smell the pula cooking. And she saw Susan and didn't know her name. But there was something in her that recognized Susan, something in just a moment recognized her. And she threw open her arms and walked over to Susan and hugged her and, and started to cry. And I knew that even though she didn't know Susan's name, that she knew Susan was a person she loved. And so what I hope for and long for is for people to have someone that the person they need caregiving for can have access to because it's so difficult to have access to that person that they can feel connected to and feel safe with. It's so difficult when we have to rotate caregivers. Thank you for that response and uh, for that heartfelt reality that I think many caregivers face, whether it's caring for an individual with dementia or a child with a mental health 
uh, condition, uh, you know, it's, it's really the lifespan perspective of the challenges of being a full-time caregiver and, and, and um, other responsibilities as well. And, and how do societies where we've lost that extended family community that I think in many cultures still exist of how do you create that trust and connection to continue to provide that care in the most natural setting that is possible, which is, is a home and is with surrounded by the folks you love. Uh, so it, it, is a, it is a significant challenge that I think caregivers across the lifespan face and certainly one that the Idaho Caregiver Alliance and I know the Commission on Aging and the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia Program through IDHW, I think we're all working hard to think about how do you recreate or um, create those environments for caregivers and the individuals they're caring for in uh, to trust, safety, um, and that community-based um, living situation.